Hey, everybody. So I am here with Tanya Dalton. We have known each other for a long time and worked together in a previous life. And Tanya is um, an incredible entrepreneur. She has an amazing story, much of which you can read about. But Tanya, tell us a little bit about your family. Tell us about you know, what life is like at home for you. Yeah, so I have two kids and a husband. So um, when I started my first business, my kids were littles, like literally playing at my feet while I was growing yeah. my business. And now my kids are six foot two, so I get 16, and Kate is now 12. So um, they have really, since the very beginning, been a big part of not just my story personally, but also my business story, um, because I've always made them a part of my business. I consider my business, even though it's a sole proprietorship, I consider it a family business. So my kids... Yeah. They have time off in the summer. They come occasionally into the office and they make boxes or maybe they make gold foil cards or they do all the different things because they really are an active member in my business. And I think that really has helped. I love that. And so when you were little, you were scaling your first business, which is when we used to work together. And then you walked away and pursued a greater passion of scaling your second business. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision? Yeah. Well, because it, it wasn't an easy choice, and yeah. we were kind of talking about this earlier before we started recording. To yeah. me, when you have a business, your business is like another child, right? Your biggest, brattiest, the one that screams out louder than all the rest, <laughs> it's your child. And you love it, and you nurture it, and you pour your love and energy and focus into it. And then when you decide that you're going to close that business, yeah. it's really not an easy decision. It's a hard yeah. choice because you feel like, am I turning my back on this, this child that I've loved for so long? But really, for me, making that decision to move on to something that I truly was passionate about really was, while it was difficult, it was something I knew I needed to do because the business was doing fine. It was doing well. It was paying our bills. And just to give um, everyone a background, my husband is actually my CMO. So I'm CEO and he's my cool. CMO. So it was our sole income paid our bills. Yeah. It allowed my children to eat the three meals a day that they do demand. I mean, it paid for everything. And so to make this decision to close that up and really focus in on what I wanted to and what I would love to do, which is what I do now, that was a decision for our whole family, which is why I think it helped that I always ran the business like a family business because we sat the kids down. We talked to them about you do. for us, right? Because we had to financially tighten our belts and then we had to work together to, to get this new business off the ground. So it wasn't an easy choice. There was a, a period of, of mourning I had to go through that, you know, I was sad that I was closing that business. Even though it was my choice, I was still sad. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't simple. But I knew that what I was going towards, which was part of my North Star, um, yeah. really was the path I was designed to be on. And it was the path that had yeah. always been waiting for me. And I had just discovered it. And now I was ready to be on it. And when you feel that way about what you do, when you feel passionate about the things that you're putting forth into the world, I think that makes all the difference. It makes those hard choices easier. Yes. And so many of you may relate to this. I always feel like the decision to either try harder or walk away is one of the most difficult decisions we face in life, whether it's a relationship whether it's a friendship, whether it is our business, right? Because you want to be able to develop that resilience muscle that gets you through that hard part, but you also want to be realistic as to whether or not a situation is fixable. What, if you were to point to any one thing in addition to that it's your passion, because the photo jewelry business, I'm sure came from a point of passion too, right? It did, yeah. Yeah, so what was the ultimate, like, what, got you over that tipping point of deciding, you know what, I'm going to take my street MBA, as we've talked about, and yeah. apply it to something else? Well, I think the tipping point for me really was that when I would go to bed at night and I would think about what I had done in the day, I felt like, what am I really doing for the world? And I, th I think we have to back up a little bit and, and acknowledge that I used to be a teacher. That was my former, former yeah. life, was being a teacher. And I think all of us who go into teaching – we do it because we want to help people. We want to impact lives. We want to make a difference. And while I was doing that for photographers, because I had a lot of education that I poured into, because I sold jewelry, but I also taught photographers how to sell yeah. them. I taught, I did a lot of things like that. You but did. I wasn't feeling like it was fulfilling that part of me. And so mm -hmm. 
for me, it was the process of sitting down and discovering what I call your North Star, which is your mission, your vision, and your core values. I had to sit down and figure out what is it that I am passionate about? What is it that I love? And in doing that, I found that education, teaching was a big part of that. Empowering women, because I was doing a lot of small business coaching and I was helping these women grow their businesses. I loved seeing those light bulb moments in their eyes. Yeah. And then I love productivity because that's what allowed me to live that life I was living with my husband working across the desk for me every single day. But we could move to Asheville, North Carolina, which is where we wanted to live, everything else. And so I think for me, it was really discovering what that North Star was. That was my tipping point. It was It all fit together. And it was like, oh, this is, this is what I meant to do. And I think that when you yeah. take the time to really understand your own priorities and your own unique desires, I think that is really powerful. And it allows you to have that tipping point so that you, you can walk away from those things that you have poured your time, energy, and focus into. I had a, such a similar experience in business myself. So, and I always say that it shows up in the fruit, right? Like your decision and the outcome of that decision shows up in the fruit that you produce yes. from each decision, right? So mm -hmm. tell us what happened within the first 18 months of starting that new business. So we decided to close up the first business, yeah. and really focus in on the second business and really focus in on growing it. And I did not move over my email list because I felt like that was not fair to take my customers from my old business and just expect them to follow me along. So I started with an email list of zero. And I started really marketing and understanding who my customer was and then speaking directly to those women about the, the things that they were struggling with and the, the pain points they were having. And so the, the day before our launch, I looked at my husband and I said, okay, this is either going to be amazing or we're going to be <laughs> under a bridge in our car. <laughs> and I kind of laughed, but it uh, wasn't quite laughing. It's <laughs> funny now that you're on the other side yeah. of it. <laughs> I can totally it's laugh. Now. Now. At the time, yeah. it was a little, a little dicey. And so um, launch day came and we had 500 orders. The, about a month after our launch, we were named one of the top 10 Facebook campaigns of 2014. Ah. Um, because we had done such strong marketing to really drive people to our products. Um, and then within 18 months, we were a seven-figure business. I had three employees, me, my husband, and one other person part-time, and we grew to a seven-figure business. Um, eight months after my launch, I was approached by a billion-dollar company um, to see if I would partner with them because they said that what we were doing in our industry – which is a decades old industry. I'm in yeah. productivity and planning. They said, you know, we've been in this industry for 40, 50 years and you're doing something so unique and different. We want to partner with you. So then I ended up partnering, partnering with this billion dollar brand, getting into national channels. And so I think it all really does stem from, first of all, knowing that it was my passion, knowing I was yeah. excited about it. I was so, you can tell, I'm already, I'm so enthusiastic yeah. about what I do. But then I also had that street MBA that you talked about. Yeah. I had the breadcrumbs and all that experience that helped get me there. All those trials and tribulations, all the struggles, all the things that I had to, to muscle through from time to time, all of that I carried along with me. You know, you can look at closing a business as a fail. That, okay, yeah. it's not continuing on, you've closed it up. Or you can look at it as this is my springboard. And that's yeah. what it was for us. It's letting go of that either yes. or and thinking about it in terms of binary thinking. And I won't give a spoiler alert, but you do have a book coming out, which I'm very I excited did. about. And I did get a little bit of a preview of it. And that's very much what you mentioned. You talked about that binary thinking of it was failed or it didn't fail. It was right or it was wrong. It was the path for me or it wasn't the path for me. And ultimately that by that um, and with, Yep. allows you to make those types of transitions that can really catapult your, your career. And most importantly, that sense of purpose, because think about how many people you help with that decision. Yep. And that is amazing. Thank and you. I, we were joking, and we were joking when we came, before we came on that I, we were probably one of your biggest customers because at the time mm -hmm. I had a seven figure yes. brick and mortar business. I had a children's mm -hmm. portrait studio chain in the Philadelphia area. I don't know if we were your biggest customer or one of. You were uh, definitely one of the biggest. Yes. Yeah. And so I went back to you a few months later and I said, what do I need to pay you to keep making jewelry for us? And you said no. And I was like, 
did. Like, I was so happy for you, but you were just like, you know, and I emailed you last night and I said, I was going through my notes and thinking about that. No, was that no hard at that time? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. I mean, because you approached me, we closed our business. We hadn't quite yeah. launched the other business. So there's all yeah. this uncertainty, right? And right. you come to me and you say, we really could, could you just do it for, for us? And, and I have to say, first of all, I loved, not only were you a great client, but you were just fabulous on so many fronts because I just, oh. I loved you. I love what you do. I loved all of that. And so that was a really difficult no for me, but it was made easier because I knew where I was going and I knew that where I was going was the right path. And you touched on this, you know, with that whole idea of like a catapult or a springboard in yeah. order for that to really have the full effect and to go as far as it can, you can't keep holding on to the ground. You have to let go, right? You have to let go so we can spring forward and you have that energy to go towards that life you really do want. So yeah, there are some really difficult no's that you have to say. I'm not going to pretend like choices are hard or easy because they're really right. hard, but choices are at the heart of who we are and how our day feels to us. I, I really believe in, we kind of touched on the fact that I have a book coming out, but choice is a big theme in there. I talk yeah. a lot about choice because we choose how we spend our day. We choose the life that we lead. We choose everything. And so yeah. I think that we lose sight of that. We lose sight of the fact that we have these choices. We feel stuck. We feel like there's certain things we're supposed to do or that we have to do and that we're just slogging through life, kind of checking the boxes of like, yep, did that, did that. And instead of stopping and saying, wait, do I really need to do that? Or do I want yeah. to do that? Or does my family want to do that? Right? Mm -hmm. We're so busy that we don't take the time to quiet ourselves down and really ask ourselves the deeper questions, partially because the, hard, the deeper questions are hard. They are hard. And it's so much easier to go on autopilot because then you don't have to feel what's happening in your business, which is really normal because we experience different emotions and we also have to choose to be different people at each inflection point. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it's 18 months later, you built a seven-figure business with two and a half people, two of whom are in your family. Yes. And who did, was there any point in which you decided that, okay, now I'm a CEO, like I'm going to have to start choosing to be different, show up different. What was that like for you? Yeah, it was interesting to me is that I like to describe myself, I liked, past tense, to describe myself as this accidental entrepreneur. Like, yeah. I don't know, I didn't, I thought I was going to be a stay-at-home mom. I thought I was a teacher, yeah. a stay-at-home mom, and then, oh, all of a sudden I'm this entrepreneur. And so I describe myself as this accidental entrepreneur. And I think that that really undervalued who I was yeah. as a CEO because it was like, I, oh, I just fell into this. And that's, that's negating all of the work and it all of, of this that I put into yeah. it. And so it really took me actually at one point telling my story to this woman I had just met. She was asking me about what I did and I was telling her about, oh, I had started this business and I did this business and then I did this business. And she was like, oh my gosh, you you were such an entrepreneur. And I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, I guess I am. This isn't an accident. Yeah. This is who I was meant to be. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. we do get caught up in just the autopilot that we don't stop and look back and say, oh, okay, this has been the path I've been on all along. I just didn't realize it, right? And so I did yeah. have to change the way I felt about it that I was CEO and I needed to take ownership of that. I needed to own that role. And I think once yeah. I really began to do that and I realized that CEO didn't stand for chief everything officer. <laughs> I love that. that. It meant that I needed to start delegating and I needed to start really thinking about um, who I could outsource to and relinquishing some of that control that yeah. we have sometimes over our businesses because nobody what you're talking about. do it as yeah. well as we do. I right. think that that really did help me. And that mindset shift changed everything for me. Yes. I love that idea of CEO not being chief everything officer. That is brilliant. What yeah. other limiting beliefs do you think, and I know you mentioned this in your book, that was like underneath that you had to surface to get to that next level of scaling in your business? Yeah. Well, I think we all have these stories that we tell ourselves. They're limiting beliefs, yeah. but we tell them like they're stories. And yeah. because they're stories, they feel so innocent. Like, and I believe that these stories generally have always 
or never in them. Right. A good mom always does this. A good friend never does this, right? A good boss always, you know, leaves the office after her employees, whatever it is. So for me, yeah. one of my big stories was a good mom is home after school every day, bakes cookies for her <laughs> kids, is there 100% of the time because that's yeah. what my mom did. And so I thought this is what I needed to do. And the funny thing is that didn't really fit who I was. I, I love work. I love what I do. I love my kids. But at the same time, and I love being a mom, but I really love working. And so I had to change what a good mom looked like for me. So for me now, a good mom loves her children the best that she can. Doesn't mean that I have to be lead volunteer and room mom for every event. Doesn't mean that I have to man every single carnival at the school and everything else. Yeah. It means I do what I can. I'm a supporting volunteer. I, I'm there with my kids. I leave the office every day at three o'clock to come at home and put on, take off my CEO hat and put on my CEO of the home hat and really focus in on my kids. So changing the way I felt about those stories that I was telling myself made a huge difference. So I think that a lot of times we have these ideas of what it, what an entrepreneur is or what a business owner is or what a, what a mom does. Yeah. Mom ones are the ones I feel like they hand you your baby and they're like, and here's your bag of guilt to go with it. <laughs> like, Don't forget this. And you're like, Oh, but it's so true. Like, yeah. I feel like, you know, with our children, we, all that we're doing is really for them. We're role modeling what a strong woman looks like. We're showing yeah. our daughters what you're, what's possible for you. We're showing our sons how women should be treated. We're showing, we're showing the world that women are just as capable of doing yeah. the things that men have done for centuries. And so that's yeah. actually one of the questions people have asked me about my book. They're like, I see it's directed towards women, but doesn't it apply for men as well? And I like to say, absolutely. But if you think about it, every productivity book out there has been written for men by men. And we've taken right. it and we've twisted it and we've turned it and we've made it work for our lives. Because we are, most of us women are the CEO of the office and the CEO of the home, right? And so we yeah. have a very different role that we play. And so this book is written for women. All the pronouns are she, the quotes are girls, but you know, it's, it's really designed and it's directed towards women. Men can take it, they can twist it and turn it to work for their lives, but this book is for women. And you are also a huge fan of giving yourself grace within that 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. It's not just saying that things have to happen at the same time every day in the same mm -hmm. way. Can you talk a little bit about that too? Yeah. Well, we have this idea that we want balance and that's definitely one of the stories we've been told. People tell us, yeah. Oh, work life balance. You're striving for balance. And to me, yeah. we do not want balance. We absolutely positively do not want balance in our lives. If you think about it, we, I like to say we have three areas of our life. We have work, home, and personal life. Yeah. Now, if those are balanced, they're all perfectly even and equal, which means you're not really moving anywhere. To really right. move any direction, to move forward, we have to lean forward. We have to counterbalance, right, and shift our weight forward, and then we have to shift back. And then we want to go a different direction, we shift another way, and we shift back. It's okay to be shifting in these different directions. We just can't yes. be leaned over for a long time. You know, when you ride a bike and you turn a corner, you shift your weight. You stay shifted over, you're going to fall, yeah. right? You have to counterbalance back. And it's the same thing in your life. You're going to have these periods where you are more focused on work. But then you yeah. lean back and then you focus more in home. And then you lean yeah. back and you focus more on work again, maybe. Or you lean back and you focus on personal. So it's this idea of, let go of balance. If you're working for balance, you're not going to move in any direction. You're just going to be standing still. If you focus instead on harmony and you see that you can do this leaning forward and this leaning backwards, that really makes a huge difference. When you start to look at your time instead of these 24 hour compartments to achieve this mythical balance where you're like, I got to, I got to spend time at work. I got to spend time in my personal area. I got to spend time in my home area, right? And instead you zoom out and you look at the 168 hours of our week, so much easier to find that harmony there. That, you know, maybe your idea of what a good mom is, is someone who's home for dinner, you know, with your yeah. kid, which I think is great. But if you're working in a business, especially where you're traveling, 
that's not possible. So any night that you don't make it home, you think, oh, I'm the worst mom. I'm such a bad mom, right? If you yeah. look at harmony instead, and maybe you have a week where, you know, four nights you were able to make it home for dinner and three you weren't. That's a win. That's harmony right there. Yeah, maybe you didn't make it home every single night, but you made it home the majority of the nights. And really, too, yeah. is it about the dinner time hour? Or is it really just about spending time with your kids and your husband and your, or your partner? You know, what is it really about? Because maybe you didn't make it home for dinner, but maybe you spent time at the park on Saturday, or maybe you guys all went to a movie on Sunday afternoon. I really want women to stop feeling like there's these things that we have to do and instead look at our lives as the things that we get to do, the things, the opportunities that we have and the possibilities that are available. I feel like right now we're so tight in these little compartments of what we have to do and checking things off and focusing in on that to-do list of three miles long, right? Running around busy all day long. And then when you go to bed at night, you feel unsatisfied and unsuccessful. You think to yourself, why didn't I get more done? Even though you were busy all day long, right? All day long. But and it happened. Long. And that's the worst feeling in the world to feel like you haven't done enough. But that's the thing, when you start to really look at harmony and you get rid of this idea of balance, that's when you really start to feel successful. When you stop focusing in on everything and instead choose to work on the things that really matter most to you. I like to tell people that productivity isn't about doing more, it's doing what's most important. It's taking five steps forward in the same direction instead of 50 steps in 50 different directions. That's where, that's I where always you feel good. Yeah. Um, I always think about how do I want my kids to remember their childhood? Like, I don't know that they're going to remember you running in at five o'clock on the dot because it checked a box. I think they will remember a fun adventure or something unique that came up or mom always took me to the movies on Sundays. Like those are the things that, you know, we remember from our childhood. Absolutely. And that's sectioning out time for your family. Mm -hmm. One story that you had in your book that I loved was the idea of that you went on a plane <laughs> with a notebook and a pen, and that was it, because you needed to do some deep work. And a lot of times, leadership is, does not come with a checklist, right? Management comes with a checklist. You can check things off the box, you know, for management, talk to this employee, had my one-on-one, -on -one, gave a performance review, delegated that task. But leadership is those unique things that don't come with a checklist that only you can do in your business, which is mo for most of us, the deep work. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how you've organized your day into prioritizing that type of work. And I, I'll just say, I thought that was gutsy. It, is, it would be very difficult for me to get on a plane without my laptop. <laughs> well, I think that's the thing is because a lot of times we'll default to things like scrolling yeah. our phone or getting on our laptop when yeah. there are times where really when we're wanting growth in our business or growth even in our personal life, where we need that white space. We need to give ourselves yeah. that time to just dream of what that vision of the future looks like. How am I going to work through this? I think that we really undervalue the idea of boredom. We think yeah. that we need to feel every single minute to not be bored. And we forget that in our own childhoods, perhaps, we rode in the car with no screens in the car. And we looked outside the window and we dreamed and we used our imagination, right? We went yeah. outside and we played and we didn't have video games all the time. We didn't have, and so because we had this unlimited vision and imagination, we were able to really think big. And I think that's the thing that's missing for a lot of leaders is we're so busy thinking that we have to check in our, with our email. We need to check in with our team. We've got to micromanage this. We've got to do yeah. all these things. We're not giving ourselves that space to really think about where do I really want to go? Where do I want to go with this business? How do I want to solve this problem? Because even though I'm sitting on the plane with an open notebook and basically probably an open mouth, you know, staring off and figure it out, but it really allows your brain to go at this problem from all different angles and solve what I really needed to solve at that moment. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to allow that space for. We think that giving ourselves breaks is this reward for doing great work when really these spaces of time are requirements for great work to really happen. We need that space, not just for ourselves to feel good, but also to really drive ourselves and our businesses where we want them to go. Love that. 
And they, for so many people who are listening, they probably are like, okay, so Tanya went from kindergarten teacher to jewelry designer to 500 orders in her first so do you, would you attribute that thinking time to your figuring it out a bull myth? I just made up um, that word. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works. Um, no, I do. I absolutely do. Because I think too, I gave myself that space before I started this first business. And even if you've started your, your business already, giving yourself the space to really think about what is it that I'm doing? What is it? Where is it that I want to go? And how do I want to get there? Which are the components of your North Star that I talk about. Giving yourself that space really allows you to have a filter in a way because yeah. there's going to be lots of opportunities that come up. There's going to be lots of things that, that, that happen that you could say yes to. But when you have a North Star, when you know what you're doing, why you're doing it, how to do it, and you know where you want to go, you're able to really filter, is this a yes for me or is this a no? Yeah. It's not as easy. A lot of people preach that whole idea of, um, you know, you got to say no, you have to say no. And it's not about saying no, it's about finding your yeses. It's about what are the yeses that are right for you and then letting go of the rest. And when you're able to do that, because you've given yourself that space to really think through your North Star and then think through the opportunities, you're really able to make bigger strides in the direction you wanna go. Yes, all right, so that is amazing advice. So. Below this video, you're going to learn how you can get a hold of Tanya's books and any extra bonuses that she has available at the time this is released that will go with that book. And what I'm going to ask you guys to do is if you love what she's been saying, please go to the, to the link and pre-order and please give a review. Reviews help authors so much. And I don't know if any of you have ever written a book, but if you have, you know it's a little bit like giving birth. So if you can just help a sister out, give her a great review, pre-order the book. She has all sorts of great um, bonuses. I don't know if right now if this is something you want to chat about, the bonuses or she's a way to find out. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what comes with the pre-order? So I can tell you, we've mentioned a couple of times in this, the idea of the North Star. And I think for a lot of people, they think, you know, what does that look like? Or how do I even start that process? And I know for me, when I started that process and I was Googling it, Everything said, start with your purpose. And I was like, oh, that's what I'm trying to figure out, right? <laughs> so I actually have a course that I've created, Discover Your North Star, that walks oh, through that. how to, what is your mission? What is your vision and your core values? Who are you and what are your priorities? And so that is actually one of the bonuses that comes yeah. with the pre-order of the book. So it's five lessons. It goes really in depth. And um, people who get to the other side of that, um, those lessons have, I've had the most powerful testimonials from, from women who have experienced um, great discoveries about themselves. So that's one of the bonuses. I also have um, a discount for Inkwell Press product items. Wow. Everyone wants to get those with the pre orders. And then you also get access to a couple of chapters of the book early, right away. Um, oh I'm going to wait for the launch. So lots of great bonuses. I'm most excited about the Discover Your North Star course because. Yes. I really feel like that course is life changing and it's, I can't remember the price of the course, but it's like $247 course. So it's, I mean, you buy a book and yeah. you get that. So it, it really is nice. Smoke and deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The smoke and deal guys. And you know, this is just, it's been such a wonderful conversation and Tanya and I are very much like-minded women um, in the sense that we are both purpose driven and you can just make sure that you stay tuned for future speakers in this series. I'm bringing on everybody that has that sense of who they are and also authenticity. They're telling real stories about real struggle. And my goal is for you to feel a little bit less alone as you grow and scale your company. So if this has helped you, make sure that you share it with friends, post it in social media, join us on Instagram as part of the conversation. And I can't wait for you to see you next time in the Scale with Joy Summit.